In the late 18th century, Valletta was full of coffee houses. Just to put you into perspective, from the Auberge de Provence to St. John's Cathedral, there were four shops selling foreign wines, newspapers from Paris, books, tobacco, and also coffee. Three of these were registered with the relevant authorities as coffee houses. This was the home of the coffee culture in Malta. The coffee plant originated in the Ethiopian highlands. Between the 14th and the 15th century, that same plant was growing around the Red Sea. Alexandria, that great emporium, took it upon itself to sell it to the Mediterranean. Venice was the transporter. In the city of Venice, coffee shops were popping all over the place. In 1663, in London, there were 83 coffee shops. In that same year, here in Valletta, there were 24. Our Valletta, however, claims its very own ode to this beverage. A relationship so intimate that any coffee shop in Malta should proclaim the story to any caffeine-deprived client that walks through their door. Domenico Magri, a Maltese priest in 1665, published what is possibly the oldest known scientific study about coffee in the world. Published in Rome, this small pamphlet talks about the virtues of coffee whose author claims is a popular drink in his native land, already in the 17th century. In a few years, coffee became an integral part of the daily life of the Maltese. Magri tells us it's the perfect drink for the student who wants to stay up and study, for the lady to keep her wits about her, and to aid the celibate priest who wishes to ward off the temptations of the flesh. The teeming city life of Valletta in the 17th and 18th century centered around the coffee culture. Many a lawyer, a notary or anyone conducting business in the capital stopped for a quick brew to freshen the senses before starting off his daily rounds. What Magri does not tell us is that coffee shops lead to gossip and gossip lead to sedition. In the 1740s, the Basha of Rhodes was enslaved on our island. To get his own back, he had decided to murder the Grand Master by poisoning his coffee. The servant who was supposed to do this got scared and so the plan was changed and it was decided to murder the Grand Master with a poison dagger. This plan was being talked about and discussed in a coffee shop close to the lower Barraca in Valletta. The owner, Antonio Cohen, got wind of this. He immediately went to the palace and told the Grand Master. The Grand Master simply decided to order a mass execution. Torture and executions were the order of the day in Valletta. Cohen for his contribution was given a palace at Merchant Street and a lifelong pension. Sometimes being a snitch pays off. If coffee led to sedition, we are told by Angelo Cilia that it also generated some energy to those who had lost it. Angelo Cilia was in front of the magistrate of the Tribunale degli Armamenti. What was the Tribunale degli Armamenti? It was the prize court of the Maltese Corsairs. It is where the Corsairs were trying to save face. They had a very bad reputation, and it was not for nothing. In this case, Giuseppe Estedan, a Corsair lieutenant who was on board a captured Turkish prize, decided to search the crew. There was a priest who was, according to him, hiding a bag of monies under his tunic. Enraged, Eshtedan punched him, knocked him to the floor, and the priest was knocked out of his senses. From underneath the tunic, a bag of gold coins was discovered. The cook on board the Maltese Corsair ship decided to revive the priest. What did he do? He brewed some coffee and spiced it with the rum which was found on board.
coffee culture in Malta is 400 years old. It deserves much better recognition. All the stories that we have told today lead us to two recipes. One by Domenico Magri. He simply says, boil the coffee, add some cloves, recite the creed in Latin, and add some sugar to taste. The other one revives the soul after you've been punched in the face by a Maltese Corsair. Boil the coffee and add the rum. Thank you.